I'm breathing slightly harder than usual by the time we reach the room, and turn to face her, fully expecting to have my head bitten off. Instead, I'm greeted by the most shocking thing I've seen since... Well, since a half-naked elven warlock dropped in my lap. Nerith looks... upset, and not in her usual rage fueled way. Her eyes are shut tight, as if to desperately block everyone and everything else out. Her hands are even clutching over her ears in a gesture so disturbingly vulnerable that I hear myself talking to her in a low voice, the way one might speak to a concerned animal, a cornered animal even. Nerith, are you okay? This isn't just about the crowds, is it? Her eyes pop open, and find mine immediately, looking angry and just a little bit frightened. What the hell do you want me to say? That you were right, and my world has always been a... A stupid fucking illusion created by other useless people like you? She spits the word you out like it's a curse, but her gaze isn't on me anymore. Instead, she's scowling up at a decorative banner from the game taking up most of the wall behind us. Moodily, she crosses her arms in front of her and keeps staring over my shoulder. I know that I don't fit into your world very well, and you've always been really aware of the fact that I don't belong here because of it. But to me, this just felt like another raid. A weird, mostly boring one, but seeing these idiots dressed up like arch demons and mages like it's nothing. She shakes her head despondently, facial features turning sad. Those clothes mean something in my world. Her eyes turn upward and she stares hard at the ceiling tiles over her head. It takes me a long minute to realize that Nerith, tough, badass Nerith, is trying not to cry. He grew. Am I real? Whoa. It's too deep for me. Her voice is small, smaller than I've ever heard it, and for a moment I'm not sure what to say. I have a feeling this is a very important question to Nerith. And I have to take my time thinking of an answer. Oh god. Um. I guess it. She, uh, she's pretty fucking real. <laughs> she's, like, killed things and lit his apartment on fire. That's pretty real. I hesitate because the truth is. I honestly don't know and I don't feel at all qualified to be helping her through this existential crisis of hers. There's no straightforward answer, so I decide to go with pure gut instinct. You're living and breathing and standing right next to me, so as far as I'm concerned, you're definitely real, Nerith. Screw what anyone else says. I offer her a weak smile, hoping my words didn't make an already bad situation worse. Nerith looks at me with a mixture of annoyance and affection that only she could ever pull off. She spared having to voice a reply as the line finally starts moving ahead of us, and we're led into the panel room. We take seats as far up front as we can manage, which isn't all that far, honestly. The panel turns out to be more of an extended Q&A session than anything else. I wait for my chance, and when the game devs open up discussion to their audience, my hand shoots into the air before anyone else's. Naturally, I'm ignored in favor of a cute blonde cosplaying as a succubus. And the rest of the panel goes by like this. I raise my hand, but I'm still just one person out of a hundred. I shoot a pointed look over at Nerith hoping she can throw a little bit of her magic around, but she isn't paying much attention. She's slouched in her chair, staring at the back of the head of the guy in front of her and looking pretty perturbed. Her concerns from earlier are clearly still bothering her. Um, We need to try and get the question answered, don't we? I sigh, deciding to keep my hand in the air. Because let's be honest, I suck at talking to people, and Nerith is an insanely difficult person to talk to on a good day. I don't have a clue how to comfort a depressed, angstful version of her. The odds of me screwing up and saying something to make the situation worse are high. It's much more productive for me to stay focused on the task at hand anyway. Or so I tell myself as I try to ignore the visibly upset elf sitting beside me for the next hour. Sixty agonizing minutes later, the Q&A comes to an end. Fuck. I lower my arm in defeat, trying to shake some life back into my, dumb, my numb fingers. What the hell do we do now? I fully expect Nerith to make some sassy comment on how I can't get anything done, but instead she simply scrunches her nose in irritation before getting out of her seat and making a beeline for the backstage exit. I think we might have made the, the wrong choice there. <laughs> it's all I can do to scramble after her. We reach the edge of the stage, fighting our way through a crowd of people moving the opposite direction before we're stopped by security. So close. We're literally only a few feet away from the developers. But Nerif is evidently done with all the tomfoolery. 
Her hands fly through the motions of a now familiar smell. Spell. <laughs> Fuck. She murmurs a low incantation, and this time I can actually taste the electricity in the air. It's like licking a battery. Not that I've ever done that. The Debs and security guards all freeze what they're doing, eyes glazed over. We're able to walk right up to them without further trouble, and I glance around nervously to make sure everyone else is out of earshot. Uh, hello. We, um, I had a question for you that, uh... Is it possible for a gateway to open between this world and the world of the... She cuts herself off, struggling to say the word, and I take pity on her. Game? The devs are obviously not so far out of it that they don't immediately start laughing at us. What are you guys talking about? There's no such... <laughs> I mean... You guys know this shit isn't real, right? Nair stiffens, and even I flinch at the harsh words. As if the elf wasn't already questioning her existence. This was the verbal equivalent of pushing a burned victim into a hot bath. A very hot bath. And now Nerith will kill. The bath. Nerith turns on her heel and marches away, leaving me to deal with the brainwashed devs on my own. Luckily, the spell doesn't wear off immediately. Sadly, however, I now have to worry about finishing up this discussion quickly, since there's no telling what kind of trouble a distressed elven warlock can get up to at a gaming convention. Uh, there's magic within the game itself that opens doors to different dimensions, so is it really such a dumb question? Get a high enough level magic user and they can even get to different planes of existence, right? So, in actuality, did, did one of you, er, uh, uh, stumble onto a gap in time and space? And turn it into a game? Maybe? My voice fades out at how stupid I sound. This is the king of idiotic ideas. The grand poobah of embarrassing moments. And please answer without laughing. Obediently, the developing team holds it in its mirth and they shake their heads one by one. No way, kid. Celestial Crossing is something we made up. It's completely fictional. My shoulders slump and I play my riskiest card out of desperation. Hopefully they don't remember this conversation when the spell wears off. Okay, well, is there anything else you can think of that might explain how a character from the game could, theoretically, get over into the real world? With amused expressions, the devs look at each other and shrug. I wilt in disappointment until one of them appears to entertain the idea for a second longer than the others. Well, if we're talking about keeping this within the realm of fantasy... Yes? ...and fiction... Right. I impatiently try to draw the words out of him faster, wanting to go check on Nerith, but also needing something, anything to show for our efforts today. Well, our magic system in the game is pretty complex, but in theory, any spell can be reversed under similar conditions. That's why shield spells and spell breaches take the same number of turns and are learned under the same school of magic. The lead developer shrugs and smiles, and I realize he's making all this up on the spot. Still, it does make sense. It's more information than we had. Got it. And, uh, thanks for answering my question. Big fan, by the way. Yeah, we kind of figured. I turn to go, feeling hopeful that maybe this whole enterprise wasn't a complete waste of time. I'm in such a hurry to find Nerith that I almost miss their parting words as I duck toward the exit. If you think of the portal between worlds as a door, then it probably opens both ways, kid. That's the best answer I can come up with without a fresh coffee. I'm all over this imagery with more seriousness than it probably deserves before mentally storing it away for later. First, I need to make sure Nerith didn't go on some kind of rampage. Everyone's dead. I scan the hallways outside the panel room, but the area is thick with gamers and nerds as far as the eye can see. Finally, I decide to make my way over to the information kiosk, hoping that Nerith might remember it and return if she gets lost. I only make it about halfway when I nearly collide with the woman herself. Oh good, I found you. Look what I got. She proceeds to shove several large convenience store bags full of yaki sober bread into my arms. Of course she does. The hell? Yeah, there was this stupid contest or something, and they really loved my armor. Because really, who wouldn't? And then they offered me some useless prize. I repeat her words dumbly, a bad feeling rising in the back of my mind. A useless prize, you said? It was money. <laughs> it was some of that flimsy paper currency you're always whining about. 60,000 yen or something like that. The fuck, isn't it like 600 bucks? <laughs> 60,000 yen! You, you walked away from... Of course not! 
I just waved my fingers, threw a little magic at them, and convinced them to award me something useful instead. She waves one of the bags in front of my face in a tempting manner, smirking with victory. You're welcome. Nara spends the next few minutes trying to get a response out of me, I think. I'm not sure what happens next, to be honest, as I more or less pass out at the thought of Nara turning down free money. Free money I could have used to fix all the shit she broke in my house. Still, at least she doesn't seem depressed anymore, triumphantly nibbling on one of her prizes. Once I'm finally recovered enough to rejoin the world of the living, I lead us out of the crowded convention center and toward the bus stop where we catch the last one heading back to the apartments. We pay our fare and share a seat toward the back. I spend the ride home thinking about what the developers said. It was all just random stuff they made up on the spot, but I try to consider it from the viewpoint that everything about the past few weeks has been batshit insane. Why stop suspending my disbelief now? So with that in mind... A door. The doorway in between Nerys world and mine was a dream the first time, wasn't it? I mean, I was asleep at the time and woke up with her suddenly there. But I'd slept every single night since then and nothing had happened. May I have to dream her away for it to actually work? Maybe, but who can control what they dream about? I glance over at Nerith, who's already fast asleep, leaning her head against the window. Would she laugh in my face if I told her what I was thinking about? Or just smack the back of my head and tell me to stop wasting my time thinking of nonsense? Hell, what if it all was just nonsense? And if it was, would having Nerith around for the foreseeable future really be that awful? I'm almost surprised to realize that, no, it really wouldn't be that bad. Nerith's a pain in the ass, sure. But I've always wanted to change things around in my life. Be tougher, stronger as a person, and she's been the only one who could force me to do that. Mostly because she's a hard ass, but also I, because I think of her as a friend. Crazy as it sounds, even in my head. And as much as she's helped me, I feel like I've helped her too. A week ago it wouldn't have been possible for her to show any kind of weakness around me. Today though, she reached out. She asked me if she was real, and my answer actually mattered to her. I can't help wanting more of that, to watch her become more grounded, grounded and able to rely on me. To see that I'm someone she can trust to have her back the way she's had mine. So no, it wouldn't be horrible to have my friend hang around a little while longer. A yawn rises up out of my chest suddenly. All this thing here reminds me we've had a long day. I'm pretty exhausted, physically and mentally. I settle in for a short nap until we reach the apartment, resting my head against the back of my seat. The bus lifts to one side as we make a sharp turn, and my head lolls onto Nair's shoulder. She grunts, but doesn't wake up to punch me in the face, so I stay there. It's a much comfier position to sleep in than trying to keep my neck craned upward. As I drift off, I realize I'll be able to process the day's events much more easily when I wake up anyway. Something feels off about this. I'm very obviously dreaming, but I've never been aware that I'm dreaming without waking up before. There's nothing but darkness around me. Darkness is a dim outline of something in the distance. When, other, when no other choice presents itself, I make my way toward the shape ahead. As I, get, as I get closer, it splits into two, and I can soon make out the form of a woman standing next to... a door. About time you showed up, useless. I'd recognize that voice in my sleep. I mean, obviously. Because I just recognized it. I finally reach the door, and the person standing next to it is indeed Nerith. She grins. Well, I didn't think you'd be able to unfuck yourself long enough to do it, but you managed to impress me, hero. You found the doorway. I look at her with my brow furrowed and realize I don't want her to go. Still, it's not like she'd leave her entire world around to hang out of mine. I'd rather chew sand than ask her to do that. Instead, I shoot for nonchalance. So, you're heading back home then? She laughs loudly. Her whole face brightens up, and it's the happiest I've ever seen the elf. No need to give me that kicked puppy look. Her expression settles into its usual arrogant smirk, and she even gives me a playful punch in the shoulder. If I leave, who's going to keep your head out of your ass? You think I'd let all of that self-confidence I drilled into you just disintegrate the minute I'm gone? Fuck that. I'm just here to make sure we close this stupid door for good so nothing else can get through. But what about your life? Your whole world? You mean my fake life in a pretend world? Why go back when I'm a real person here? 
I'm dumbfound- I'm dumbfounded that my words had such an impact on her. Oh, so if we'd said she's fake, maybe she'd go back and we'd get like a sad ending or something? I gape for a minute before she snaps her fingers in front of my eyes impatiently. Since you're here, care to do the honors? She gestures towards the door, which is starting to glow around the edges, almost like it's beckoning us through. Creeped out, I shut it tight and throw the latch that appears on the outside. The moment it locks, I feel a light smack on the top of my head and jolt awake. We're home, useless. Get your fat head off me. Despite her less than gentle wake up, she's smiling. I grin back and we make our way off the bus. The bus stop is otherwise pretty much deserted, except for a figure making its way toward us in the dark. I lead the way forward only to bump, almost literally, into Mika. Hikaru, Nerith chan, fancy meeting you two here. She laughs a bit, giving Nerith a small wave before looking up at me. I might be imagining it, but she seems to be fidgeting more than usual, playing with the hem of her skirt and pushing strands of hair out of her face as she talks. Since you're here, I was wondering if you could grab the dishes I lent you guys the other day when I brought food. I open my mouth, but Nerith abruptly speaks over me. No problem, I'll run ahead and grab them. Man, she's such a good matchmaker. She gives me a very pointed look as I dig in my pocket for the key to give her. The look clearly says, don't fuck this up. I try to nod my understanding at her discreetly and she smirks, punching my shoulder once before turning toward the apartment in the dark. Does she always do that? Pretty much. Mika and I walk toward the building a few steps before my hand shoots out, almost out of its own accord, to stop her. Mika-chan, wait. She turns to face me, and her face is illuminated in the light of a nearby street lamp. She's beautiful. Her eyes are wide and warm, and there's definitely affection there. Is there also a glimmer of attraction? It's hard to tell. I'm no expert on women. But after everything else I've been through, this finally feels like something I can take a chance on. I take a deep breath and call on all the self-confidence I've gathered from going through such a life-changing ordeal. Mika-chan, the sunny I need to tell you. She says nothing. Instead, her cheeks, light, her cheeks light up softly with a blush and her smile turns shy and hopeful. Oh, ending number one, home. Is that it? Is it going to take me back to the main menu or is it like an epilogue? Oh no, that was it. <laughs> huh. I don't actually know how many endings there are. There you go. Oh look, we got all the, the voice talent there. Oh, I knew it was Kevin MacLeod, I fucking knew it. <laughs> so it wasn't from a visual novel I'd heard it, it was all Kevin MacLeod. Man, that's a lot of music. And it sounded really good actually. Kevin MacLeod does, does great music. Well there you go, that was uh, the first ending for Celestial Crossing. I know it's going to update at some point to add achievements, so it'll be easier to tell. Uh, how many endings there are. I don't think I can check right now. But I think that was a pretty good ending. I guess he and Mika get together and then Nerith stays. So I assume that was what that was the good ending. So I, I don't think there's too many other ones. Anyway, that was my playthrough of Celestial Crossing. I really liked that game. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the little mini series. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye! If he breaks my water station, I'm going to be so sad. Can I, like, hit him with this hammer? Fuck. No! My water purifier! <laughs>